Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Is it morning? Oh, it's morning. Oh my God, it feels like it's afternoon. How are you all doing? Fine, yes. Good to see you all here. Thank you for coming. My name is Natalie Metheuver. I'm the Executive Director of Choice for Youth and Sexuality. And I have the honor to be your moderator today. This session uh, is organized by, by Choice for Youth and Sexuality, UNFPA, and the Widom for Girls Collective. And before we start, I would really like to start with acknowledging that we are on the indigenous grounds here. And we would like to acknowledge the First Nations people of Canada and British Columbia. And I also would like to acknowledge that we're going to talk about young people here. There's a lot of young people present at Women Deliver, but we also have a, young, uh, a lot of young people and other people as well who couldn't be here today because of several issues. And we would like to acknowledge that, yeah, they are also part of the stories that we're going to talk about. So let's honor them. So today, we're going to, uh, the, the event is called My Body, My Rights, and we're going to talk about young people. Because young people are taking up more than half of the world's population, and we're fighting for their SRHR, but they also have a big say in this. So I'm having a lot of beautiful people here in my panel. Um, that are going to talk about youth-powered solutions to SRHR challenges in different countries around the world. But before we start and we hear their, their stories, I'd like to just get you a little bit into the mood um, and, and, and talk about what are actually the issues that young people um, think about and talk about and want to know about or the myths that they have uh, that they hear in their communities and their lives. So we're gonna do a little game. I'm sure you know uh, two truths and a lie. We're gonna do two lies and a truth. So I'm already giving you away that there's gonna be one lie, uh, of uh, one truth and two lies. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd like to uh, see um, how you think about all of these statements. So I invite you to uh, get your smartphones or smart devices out and just go to the following um, link. Everyone's busy. Is everyone there? Can we continue? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Stefano. Condoms protect against all STIs. Yes or no? Yes, I see a big, um, a big group going for no. And there's 20%, yeah, going for yes. Um, actually, it's indeed no, because there's also STIs that can trans be being transferred by skin-to-skin -skin contact. So this was a truth or a lie? It was a truth or a lie? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, next one. You have to wash the inside of your vagina with soap to ensure that it's clean. Ooh, no is running, <laughs> running, running, running. <laughs> I think there's a lot of ladies in the room here as well. Indeed, the vagina is uh, self-cleaning. Um, and uh, yeah, you just don't want to try it. Just don't try it because it hurts. <laughs> All right. The average amount of menstrual blo blood per period is less than a shot glass. Haha, uh -huh. have you ever measured, ladies? Ooh. 60 40, 60 40? Yes? Well, we looked it up, we looked it up to, uh, <laughs> to give you the, the, the evidence. Um, the average, of a, a shot glass is 45 milliliter, milliliter? and um, the average uh, menstruation blood that, that comes up per period is around 35 milliliter. So um, actually it's not more than a shot glass, although you might feel like it's more than a shot glass. I must say, as an older woman, <laughs> If 
if you had done the average of an older woman, it would have been more. So when you approach menopause, it increases. Thank you for that contribu contribution. And this is indeed the average. So it's not uh, one, uh, one group. Okay, thank you. Um, this was our, uh, our small quiz. Um, and I'd like to continue uh, to hear some uh, stories about my lovely panelists here. We have Carlos, we have Fatuma, Janice, Annika, and Bitania. So Carlos, let's go for it. Um, once one um, note to make about the presentation, we're doing pecha kuchas. I'm not sure if everyone knows this concept, but pecha kucha is the Japanese word for small talk or mambo jumbo. Well, we're not gonna get small talk here, but um, the, um, the format is that uh, every speaker has a couple of, of uh, pictures and they have each 20 seconds to present on every pic picture. So bear with them <laughs> because it's actually quite hard to, uh, to do some kind of um, presentation like that. But um, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Carlos. Okay, uh, good morning. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Punica, and I'm from Mozambique. Um, uh, women deliver for young leader, and then I'm passionate about uh, sexual good health. And then I'm going to explain why I'm, I'm, why I'm passionate and then what I'm doing. So I have to say that in, in Mozambique, uh, more than half of the population are women, and most of them they are living in rural areas. But uh, what is happening is uh, where they, most of, of the women they live in rural areas, they have no access to sexual and reproductive health services. And in, in Mozambique, uh, we have very high rates of child marriage and also teenage pregnancy because girls, they have no choice uh, to decide about their bodies and to fulfill their, their rights. So I think in most of, of, of the case, uh, girl, uh, teenage pregnant, they have to work around kilometers and kilometers to access uh, the, the services. And that's why it, it's make uh, to have very high rates of maternal mortality because of the lack of, of the services. And if you go to the rural community, you'll find that uh, at least people that just have, for example, for one million or two million people, they just have one, one clinic. And then also in those clinics are not in the community. Most of them of the clinic are, are in, this, in the village. So I think it makes um, women uh, more vulnerable. It makes girls more vulnerable. Uh, they have no access to uh, contraceptive methods. They cannot decide if they want to do abortion because they have no services. Uh, they cannot even uh, take condom because it, they, they are not accessible in most of the community. But also, there's a lot of things around uh, cultural norms. So what we, what we did, I think we have to figure out how are we going to make sure that girls uh, and adolescents have access to sexual and put health uh, services, and then also they can uh, decide uh, about uh, their sexuality. In 2017, we started a, a, a project. Uh, so and then we trained 16 young people uh, to be peer educators and then to work in the communities. Uh, and then those, uh, so let me say also, I think to, to, to remember, this project, it was just implemented in one province and then in three districts of the province, not the whole country. So what the, those young people, they are doing. And at first they have to go and then the community to create awareness about what is so important for young girls uh, to go and then access to sex and put to health. Because there's a lot of cultural norm that uh, don't allow girls to go and to seek for sex and put health uh, supplements. And other thing they do, because I think also uh, we have two, two situations. In the cities, it's a, there are some cultural norms that they're not going, but in the community, they have no access to those uh, services. So the young, uh, our peer together, they also take the services to the community. They, together with the health providers, they go to the community, they put the services access, they put contraceptive access, uh, they, 
provide the condoms. Uh, they go where the people are. They take the services where the people are. Those people that cannot access the services because they, there's no services. Uh, so there's a lot of issues that they do in the community. Uh, they try to do like road shows, but also to trying to motivate community and then they take the services. Because what they, they do is just go to the community, they talk with the parents, they talk with young people. They, okay, there is an, another solution. We don't have the services, but I think there's something that can be done. While we don't have services in our community, but something can be done. So what they do, they, 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 bring, they take hope to the people. They take, okay, you are still young, you can get condom, you can use condom, I hear accessible. They go to school and then they talk, uh, they go to school, they talk with young people. Because in, in the city, what happening is, young people, there are some people that even don't know that there like, exist youth-friendly corners where they can go and then they can access uh, the services. And then also it's, it's about to how the services are, are, are youth friendly. So they go to the community, they talk with community leaders, uh, uh, they participate in some space where the disease have been taken in community. So we, we have young people, we make sure that young people in, in community level, they can also uh, be part of the decision, like they can influence the decisions that have been taken uh, in, in the community. So they do a lot of community, they try, uh, because the issue is, uh, they show that if young people is, is there, because it's about us, it's about our rights, it's about uh, our life. So uh, we take the girls to make sure that also the, the girls are be part of the solution in the community. They, in, in, they influence the decision being taken and then they, they say what they really want, what they really desire. And I think they, they show the community if the girls they can participate, if girls can get access, if the girls they can choose when they want to get pregnant, how many children they want to have. And then also I think we invite like boys also to be part of this process because I think this is the decision that they have to support their partners about uh, the choice that they make. So I think also it's part of uh, our job as I said, that's also it's about young people being part of decision makers bodies in, in the community. So now we have young people uh, because you show evidence that in the community, show evidence that if young people are there, I think it's meaning that the, the, the service will be more youth friendly because young people will, will say, this is what we would like the service to be look like. And also I think we decide that we, we need a space in the community. We need our space because we have to decide. We have also to propose how the service is. And what we, we, we are doing, we have young people participate in, in some health uh, committees in the community that exist. And so as a result of some actions that we, we are doing. We have now uh, the increase of the number uh, of young people getting access of the service. For example, I can share an, an example. For example, we started the, our program in 2017. So we have now 20,000 20, young people that have visited uh, youth friend services for their first time. And then I think the number of girls who access uh, the contraception I think it increased like three times from uh, around uh, a thousand for five thousand now. So I think this is we we see and then our experts show that if you have young people participate, I think uh, we can increase uh, the quality of the service. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, did we mention that Carlos is a, is a young uh, leader from Women Deliver? And um, yeah, I really like what you were saying about having those young people into the community to also show the community we are there and we have a voice and we have rights and we can contribute. And amazing results that you were able to triple the amount of people that are, uh, that are going to see the services. So um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Carlos and also later for our other panelists. However, uh, we're going to uh, save the questions for later because we have a nice and interactive format to do that. So um, I'd like to go uh, further with my, um, with my second speaker, Fatuma, she's from Kenya and she's the ED and founder of the Pater Pastoralist Girls Foundation. <laughs> she's going to talk about uh, uh, youth initiatives and how they are engaging other community stakeholders uh, to talk about FGM.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Fatou McKinsey. I am the founder and executive director of Pastoralist Girls Initiative. May I take this opportunity to personally share my own experience, my involvement in the community to educate girls on acquiring knowledge and timely information on adolescents' sexual reproductive health rights. If you look at the first picture, there was a small girl. 37 years ago, that was me, because that is the hardship those young girls go through when they are, they are given the mantle to lead a family. Because we come from a community that pastoralism, we move from one place to another to acquire pasture and water. Community, uh, my community practices pastoralism, and uh, we do a lot of community meetings under trees that you, the, the picture you are seeing. We, we, we ensure that a community conversation are done according to our cultural practices. Uh, the girls in my community cannot access education because education is a challenge in the community I come from because the, the nature of the livelihood we live in and the terrain we live in the community is very harsh and very, very hot climate. Basic education is a challenge. 12 years girls are circumcised and married at a tender age. You see all those small girls, all of them have suitors because men have already decided to choose husbands for them immediately they are circumcised. And once they are circumcised, they go through a lot of challenges in terms of bleeding. They go a, a lot of challenges when they receive their menses because you will see some of the girls are stitched in a way that there's a blockage that affects their kidney and some of them cannot even pass urine. Pastoralist Girls Initiative came up with, with good programs that are empowering young girls to acquire knowledge on sexual reproductive rights. We have girls forums that talk to each other. We have uh, girls caravans of hope whereby girls share their stories, stories that are, 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 are very huma human and uh, they, they reach to each other in terms of ensuring that the girls don't go to the challenges they have gone. I have gone through that, and if it was not my mom, luckily, if it was not my mom, I could not have been standing here and talking to you today. Normally, my mom says uh, that uh, if she couldn't have cut the chain because she had the same problem her grandmother had, she had the same problem her great-grandmother had, but she decided to cut the chain. But there is one thing she can never reverse. One thing that she can never reverse is she can never reverse the challenges I went through when I went through FGM. But it is something I can cut the chain by not circumcising my daughter. <laughs> the, stigma, the stigma currently my daughter goes through is very difficult. But because I have gone through that, I give her and reflect her with my life. Young girls are getting married off at that tender age, and the girls we work with, those ones who have been married, we ensure that we take them back to school. What we, ha we have developed as an organization is catch-up centers. Catch-up centers is an, a, a place whereby girls go and do remedial classes so that they can go back to school and uh, take up with the other girls. In that catch-up uh, centers, we educate them on protection. In my community, sex is not discussed. In my community, family planning is a, is a taboo to discuss. It is the man to decide for you the number of children you are going to have. Whether you will have it through challenges or whether you will have it the way, uh, the, the normal way, it is a man's decision. But we came up with a strategy of engaging the, uh, the community leaders. We told them that what your girls and your women are going through is not something new people will like to go through. So with, with the community leaders we have brought on board, now there is a discussion going on among my community by bringing the elders in the on the table to discuss with them. Initially, the women discuss separately, the men discuss separately. But now, the men and the women are openly discussing about issues of sexual reproductive health rights. And that is because we made a lot of community entry by engaging the young people, by engaging the victims themselves, by engaging the girls who feel like they need that change to happen. And that's why we always 
use the word cutting the chain so that uh, we need to reverse the entire process and ensure that the challenges the girls have gone through should not continue going through. So uh, we, we, we ensure that uh, our community elders get involved in the process, accept the challenges that our girls have gone, embrace the change, and we, we look at the changing the narrative from different perspectives. The perspective we are looking at is ensuring that the youth take the responsibility, the young girls take the responsibility to advocate for themselves, to push for their own agendas. Instead of letting others change for you, we, the girls themselves take the responsibility to advocate for themselves, to push for their, for, their, for their ideas. And we came up with a commitment, signing commitment letters from parents who withdraw their girls from school. The commitment they sign is that uh, we also as an organization sign a commitment to ensure that uh, if they give us a girl, we will support them in a livelihood program. If they give us a girl to take to school, we will ensure the girls go to, to, to get quality education. So we came up with a, a strategy of using media, electronic media, in our local Somali dialect to reach out to a number of big uh, community elders and that is done weekly and it is used we use the social media also to reach out to the to the girl we use a, 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 an empowerment talk whereby the girls created safe space for them called bilan bilan is a somali word from my community coined as the first girl we want our girls to be the first to be recognized in all the empowerment programs that we are doing Thank you so much, Fatuma, for that very inspiring talk. I think uh, you heard from the public <laughs> that uh, they love the work that you're doing. And indeed, what I also like is that you empower the girls to speak out and to say, we are the next generation, we don't want this, and we are fighting against this. And this gives a lot of empowerment to the young girls to also talk to the elderly people and say, we need to change this. So thank you very much. Our next speaker, Janice, she is a mentor for I Am A Girl in Barbados, and she's going to talk about access for younger girls to services. Hi, good morning to everyone. Um, so I'm a part of an organization that seeks to empower and improve the lives of girls ages five to 18. And I'm gonna tell you a story. I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you are a young woman, a young girl, age 15, and is 1948. And you get home to your mother telling you, you've been promised. Because it's the, the norms of the times. And after being married, you find out, you, change, you see your body changing. You want to know what's going on. You want to find out, you want to visit the doctor, but you can't because you're too young you can't go on your own and you feel as though your mother is going to think you're stupid for even wanting to have wanting to have these questions answered or having these questions so you stay quiet you say nothing and you shut down believe it or not that young woman was my grandmother she faced the same issue that girls around Barbados are facing today in 20, 2019 being able to consent to sex at age 16, but unable to receive medical care by themselves until age 18. And that is a gap that cannot be there. Because in between that gap, the girls are, girls are going through things. They're having experiences that they need questions. They need questions answered for them. They need to be able to get information from reliable sources because oftentimes girls go out and ask the wrong people and get information that can lead them to lead to them harming their body their bodies and because of the the fact because of the fact that you can consent to sex at 16 but can't receive medical care alone until 18 on alone until 18 girls um have a breakdown in communication because of a breakdown in communication with their parents they cannot 
receive these things and they have questions. And here's how uh, McGraw Barbados has been working and to solve this issue. Um, providing girls with accurate, with adequate pre and postnatal care when they become pregnant and also after birth classes where they can learn how to take care of themselves, take care of their babies. Giving adequate, giving, giving adequate services and sources of information where girls can learn about safe contraceptive methods and also about STDs, STIs, and teen pregnancy. Using our networks to provide girls with advice on services and sources so they can be able to gain as much information as they want and need to have. <sighs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> Lobbying to officials to have them officials and legislation makers to review and reform these laws that cause there to be a disparity where our girls are cannot receive the things that they need, cannot receive that, that power of knowing what's happening in their bodies, that power of feeling confident in their bodies. Um, providing our girls with complimentary counseling where they can air problems that they're having, air issues that they're having, and coming to um, decisions that can be healthy for them. We have been using group therapy in the form of drama therapy, where girls use theater to express themselves the way they think they should be expressed, the way they use this also to be able to set goals, to create interpersonal relationships, and to have a way of also sharing with other girls answers to questions they may also have. We have, <clears throat> we with, but this problem, mental health is becoming a leading issue in Barbados, where girls can, because they don't have that communication with persons around them to talk about sex, sexual reproductive health, they, um, they tend to shut down and become depressed. They, they tend to develop mental issues because of this and we have been going around and creating safe spaces where girls can say things how they need to be said so that we can create solutions to the issues that they're having the way they think they should be solved and things and because of this girls are able to receive mentorship are able to have the things that they the fundamental things they need to make informed decisions about their bodies, their health, and everything with it. And the way how you as persons can help with this is to go into your community and find young women out there who need mentorship. Go on social media and share that information. Meet them where they are because phones are our way of life of young people. Meet us where we are at. Put that information out there where it's easily accessible continue to make continue to research continue to pull to do studies where we're always refreshing that information making sure that it's always up to date where girls are getting the best the best and most accurate information that they need to have informed decisions because they are the expert on their body. We're on their bodies. We're only here to allow them to channel that expert knowledge with um, these different studies. And I want persons to, when you see a young woman, don't just see a girl that is there. See a powerful voice. See a powerful expert in everything that is to be a young woman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don't we want all 
to have such a mentor as Janice. Seriously. The way you are talking about the girls you're working with, you're empowering them so much to do the lobbying, to do sit together and to get the information. It's super powerful. Congratulations. Our next speaker is Annika. She is the head of the sexual and reproductive health branch at UNFPA. And she's also going to talk about her experience with young people and working on SRHR. So I will be talking about rights and choices from, for young, of young people. From me, as I remember myself, from me as growing up in Ethiopia, me as a midwife, me as chief of SRHR, and me as a grandmother. And this picture says it all. So go. <laughs> Here I am, 13, so many things were there for me as a Swedish 13-year-old. Information, safety, loving, progressive parents, and yet I had so many questions. Would my breasts develop? Would anyone like me as a girlfriend? And the only thing we could talk about together were the periods and how painful they were. But my periods were not painful, so I just did it to belong. Realities of young people are different today, to some extent and in some places, but we still have to get over many barriers. And we need to talk about it. Maybe because I was a, mid I was a midwife when my sons grew up, I had an easier way to talk to them. My son, 16 year old, came to s one day to say to me, Mom, I, I shouldn't talk to you about this, but my previous girlfriend ruined my sex life. And I was so happy he came to me to say that. And he didn't go into details, but yes. Oh, 20 seconds are long. <laughs> so, I think it must have gotten stuck, right? So, but realities differ. And they change, but they also remain. This photo was taken in 1962 in Ethiopia by my father. She is 12. It is her child. She had no choice. And still many girls of her age do not have a choice. And it was, of course, for her not just to survive childbirth. But then we also know that realities change, and we need to keep in mind what improves. Girls' education go up, uh, contraceptive prevalence goes up, child marriage goes down, FGM decreases in most countries. And we are here together today, older and younger, and that changes things. There is a backlash on CSE. It is not universally accepted, and I don't want you to think that this is just a, an Islamic issue. It's in many countries. It's in parts of my country as well. But it's not just about accepti accepting it as a whole, but also quality is an issue. Age of consent is an issue. Abstinence-only programs do not work. And I hear voices. Sex is not for young people. I heard at the World Health Assembly one country saying that SRHR language is just to normalize teens having sex. That is normal. Although I wouldn't do it on the street like this, I, I should say. And on top of that, you all need to navigate a very complex and maneuver a very increasingly complex world. Fake facts, pornography, body image pressure, beautification industry, and us older, well-meaning people that try to advise you from our experience when it's your experience that should count. Changing realities is also about humanitarian and crisis. People are on the move. Many young people are on the move trying to get their rights and choices or just forced to flee. So family structures break up, break down, and social norms, and boys are getting under increasing pressure for, to show their masculinity. And it becomes sometimes toxic. But what they want to show is their humanity, as much as we, as women and girls, want to do that. So we need to support that as well. That's their rights and choices that needs to be heard. I think it's stuck. <laughs> Lack of rights and choices influence our psychosocial well-being. And we know that two issues account for girls 15 to 19 dying. One is maternal mortality, dying in pregnancy and childbirth. The other one is suicide and self-harm. And I bet, 
And we know that much of that suicide and self-harm is because they didn't get their SRHR needs met. So how can we increase rights and choices? We need to listen, 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 and we need to scale up, scale up, scale up on evidence and work on how we get rid of judgmental uh, approaches. We need to work with self and structure. We need to make sure that girls get vaccinated. We need to show, make sure that there is access to contraception and safe abortions. We saw in Colorado when they uh, had free contraception to young people that unsafe abortions went down with 42%. We need to provide menstrual health mm -hmm. support and we need to challenge boys to also understand what that means. To have a period every month that sometimes is painful where you're always worried about the color of your clothes or whether something would show. And I would encourage the boys and men in this room to just use a pad once, you know, just put it in your, in your underwear and see what it feels like walking around with and see if it shows. <laughs> it is about changing mindsets. And what does it take? Openness comes from understanding and demystification but also relieving anxiety. And now we're stuck again. I don't know what happened to me. I got more time. <laughs> but it's also about engaging all stakeholders. And this is an example of a very important stakeholder. She's Teresa John, sorry, I can't, Ndovi. And she's the chiefess of, of uh, South Africa. And she came to the Menstrual Health Symposium and she spoke about the need for services and materials for young girls. We need to have increasing trust. We need to come together. Boys and girls need to share, need to support one another, need to cheer one another on, need to protect one another. Because your time is now. And this one, I think we need also to uh, connect what we're talking about here with climate and how we need to understand together and for young people also to take the leadership for this work and for us to let young people lead is extremely important. I think that a movement is necessary and I think the movement is there already. It's just us, a bit aged, that have a hard time hearing what the movement is saying. In one session yesterday I heard a young woman said, stop talking about family planning. And that has been going on for many years. We need to look to young people for the leadership and we need to step back. We need to give that space to realize what that leadership will look like. Natasha is one leader, but I tweeted, texted to some people the good thing is that there are so many Natashas out there in the world. We just need to listen. And I think this is the force of young women, young girls, but also together with their allies in young men and young boys. And if we can realize that, I would like to show you my granddaughter, Ida, climbing a wall. She's young here, she's four. And she's climbing that wall quite fearless. She's a bit worried. But if we can let young people do what they want to do, we will have a very different world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think the, 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 the last um, picture uh, strikes me. And I'm thinking, Ida, can you please join our movement? And Let's, let's get her into the movement and please, indeed, um, I like to say that you're, the fact that you're saying, let's listen, let's listen. If young people say, stop talking about family planning, but st start talking about something else, then let's talk about something else. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our last speaker, but certainly not the least speaker, is Bitanya. She is a young uh, researcher for PSI and, um, and she has developed um, uh, a program that works on uh, connecting um, family planning to financial means and how this works together. Yeah, 
something like that. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's such an honor to follow such an, uh, an energetic panel. I've enjoyed each and every second of each presentation. So my name is Bitania, as uh, explained. Um, I will talk about how empathy and rigor can transform the SRHR uh, programming. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word youth, energy, vibrance, strength, curiosity? uncertainty, so many things. But then this picture reflects that young people cannot just be boxed in under the name youth. They have different needs, different uh, visions, so we need to empathize with them to actually understand what they're going through. And through the flagship pro project of P Population Service International called Adolson 360, we try to resonate with girls and include the girls and young designers like myself to design the project and also implement it. We have about 280 young designers across the three uh, countries in Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, that understand young girls, um, the, the young girls' needs, and then we define, we are the voices that uh, expresses the, the needs and desires of young girls expressed by themselves. So this is a married girl in one of the remote country, remote areas of Ethiopia. She has a dream of owning a small shop but having another mouse to feed would not make it easier. So through the, the Population Service International's Adolson 360 project, she managed to get contraceptive and uh, delay pregnancy by five years so that she can focus on her dreams. So under the Adolson 360, we came up with a project called Smart Start. It's a financial planning platform for rural uh, young married couple to actually uh, understand the cost benefit of delaying pregnancy. So this is a visual representation and very understand, uh, very easy to understand for a rural couple to visualize what they want from uh, in their lives and then to visualize what it would take to uh, delay pregnancy. And then this gets conducted by government uh, health extension workers that make sure that um, uh, rural girls in the most unreachable areas get reached by uh, this consultancy. And um, it brings together, like you see, uh, they, they can also access it in the health posts that are uh, built by the government. So it's the Smart Start is integrated with the government platform to reach young girls in the rural areas to access their sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, so based on, uh, okay, it's stuck. <laughs> so what's very exciting about this project is that it consult, uh, it, the consultation gets uh, conducted for both uh, the girl and her husband. Um, the health extension workers explain how they can use uh, uh, their time to reach the goals that they set for themselves because uh, young girls, this is not just about clients, but that they, they, they have needs, they have dreams. This is another consumer that is very, very happy that uh, she's now able to openly discuss about sexual and reproductive health rights with her husband because it's uh, a joint need for themselves to attain financial stability before they start um, families. Uh, this is another married couple that are very, very happy with the Smart Start project because they have, uh, like, all the other couples that we've talked to, they want financial security before uh, starting the family of their own when they're ready, when they want it. So uh, we're helping girls set plans, build their skills towards their goals, and providing tools like contraception to help them stay on track to achieve their dreams. So this is also one of our consumers that took the implant uh, contraception method uh, through Smart Start Project and she's very happy and she's determined to make her dreams a reality because now she doesn't have to worry about teenage pregnancy. Uh, this is also another couple that already had a child before coming to our services, but now they understand that uh, delaying the second pregnancy would actually help them reach their goals financially and also it's healthier for the mother. So it's very exciting for the rural couples to come together and decide for themselves what they want and where they want to be. Uh, this is so exciting as well because it's being accepted by the community. Uh, older mothers understand the difficulties that they went through when they were raising many children. So our, the government health extension workers explain to them what the project is about so that they advocate for the project and identify the girls and the communities. 
um, these are um, the local women's development army, a group of volunteers who support health services outreach. Uh, these are well-respected older women from the community that are actually determined to uh, see a better and healthier next generation uh, by the implementation of Smart Start. So they're making it possible to get through the community. And this is not just about sexual and reproductive health. This is not just about sex. So that's why we're joining hands with the husbands, mothers, and fathers, and the different community members to actually understand um, that girls and their influencers are more than just SRHR clients, but human beings with, with dreams, and we're just supporting them by uh, contraception methods. So uh, just 16 months as, after we started adopting the implementation process, we've managed to reach close to 20,000 adopters. And seven in 10 girls voluntarily take up on uh, different methods of contraception through Smart Start. And we're still getting momentum and getting accept accepted by the community because we're changing the narrative for young ruler couples to decide on the family they want by their own terms. And as of this Monday, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation announced that they'll be investing $14.3 million to scale up this 20,000 to 200,000 young beauty couple. Uh, so how did we get to this uh, success? We did it by empathy. We understood what the girls need. We have many young designers like myself that go into and understand, that go into the shoes of the girls to understand the needs and the vision they have for themselves. And it brings together a wide range of experts from different backgrounds to actually understand what it means to achieve their, their goals and then help them with contraception methods. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bitanya. And I have to apologize. Is it on? Yeah. Because I, um, I introduced you as a researcher, but you're a designer. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm so inspired by your talk and uh, to see how this group of young designers um, went into the community and, 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 and be in the shoes of indeed what those young couples need because let's let's say we're all we're all like them we all are young couples and um and we know what what we need and what, what the struggles that we have so and congratulations also on the on the new funding uh, yeah. to scale it up <laughs> so when uh we were designing this session uh we said okay there, there may be a lot of questions but we want to do this in a little bit of a different way than uh is normally done in such sessions so um because we wanted to be a little bit more interactive and um that means that uh, you are going to be involved and uh, i think uh, everyone on their chair has found a number is that true can you show it to me yes so what we're going to do is we're going to do a small role-playing exercise. Um, and we have, a, we have a statement, and uh, I see a lot of people standing up now. You don't have to participate if you really don't want to participate, so don't be afraid, and there's no right or wrong. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a statement, and um, uh, we're going to assign a role, and then I'd like to invite one of you, to answer uh, this statement. So, um, my man Stefano, can you help me? <laughs> so this is, this is the first, oh, okay, let's, let us first pick a role, of I'll pick a person that, that could help us in this, uh, in this role play. So uh, a number between one and 80, there you go, who has number 78? Everyone's like, ooh, I don't have it. <laughs> 78, anyone? 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 No? Can we have a different number? 71? <coughs> oh, such a shame. A different number? 45. Somewhere here. Oh. A last number? 55. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Can we give it up? Thank you so much. What's your name? Amina. Amina. I'm going to give you this mic. Thank you. So um, the, the statement is as follows. 
You are invited by the local government to take part in a consultation process for youth services. And you share your concerns in a meeting, but you don't feel you were listened to. What do you do? And I'd like, I invite you to take the role on as a youth activist. So get into the shoes of that, that young person and, and yeah, how would you react in this kind of situation? Okay, so I work, um, I have a reproductive health organization in the Philippines and we work with young people and so I've seen firsthand what they do. So as a youth advocate, a activist, I would take to my networks, I would coordinate with the people on my Facebook pages, Instagram pages, the people in my university, the people in my communities, and I would organize with them, tell them about the meeting, tell them how I felt while the meeting was happening. If I felt that they weren't really paying attention to me, I would highlight that. If I know who the people are, I might put their names out on social media and ask if anybody's friends with them and knows them and could tell them that maybe next time they should listen a little bit better and make my suggestions again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have a present for you. <laughs> oh, so there were some treats, just saying. Thank you so much for that contribution. Um, so you would really take it out and take the activist perspective and say, okay, then we're gonna mobilize more young people and we're gonna make sure that our voices are, voices are heard. I'm gonna turn to my panel here and I'm gonna ask Carlos, did you ever experience something like that and, and how did you go about it? Okay, I think, okay, one, two. <laughs> I think, yes, we have experienced a lot of that. Uh, so you are, you are in a meeting and then you think that you are not listened to. Uh, I think what we, we did, because I think in our case, in our, in our project, because I think we know that we are not health providers, but the, the, uh, in our community, the government is who is responsible to provide the services. The issue is we have, uh, we, we know that we have to work with the government, we have to push for the government, because those are very important. So the, the issue that we did, we avoided to, uh, to have a crash with them, uh, but I think we, we tried to find a uh, very strategic. And another thing that we, we did, that's actually uh, in this project that we're doing, that to show that when young people are there, I think we, the, the service are also, uh, the, how the service are delivered can, can improve. And we showed the result. For the beginning, we're not part uh, of some health committees, uh, because when the, the health committee would design it, uh, it was just adult people, not like community leader, health provider, but no young people inside. And then we started, and then we, for the beginning we pushed, no, we want to be there, because I think most of the time, the discussion around in, in those community, they're not talking about sexual and health. They, they just talk about like uh, some tropical disease, like malaria, that is uh, like malaria, cholera, but no one is talking about sexual and health. No one is talking about what young people really need. So we tried to, of course, let, let's show them that we have power. Let's show them that we can. And then what we, we, we are saying, it makes sense. And so we, we started. And what happened is it's now, because when we start the program, we say, because we have young people that are working in health uh, facilities, in, in health clinic. So we, we say, we, we say, okay, we want to be there so we can support and in terms of young people and then in, in the waiting room. While young people are still waiting for, to see the daughter, we can be there and then you can talk with them. And then, but the, but the result that we had, and then we, for the beginning, we were just thinking about to have young people like twice per week. But, and, and then, the, then they asked us, no, I think we want you to be whole week, not just two days per week, because you, you are helping. And then also they said, no, you should be part of these communities, uh, because I think the results that you are getting are also very important for us. So I think it, it is also, of course, uh, in, our, in our case, we just uh, trying to be more like political like them, and then also try to, to act, okay, to know what's, of course, what they're against, and you, you, you trying to, to discover what are the are are are, are the that are there, and then you take the putin that are, are there. Thank you. So you negotiate something small, then show that it works, that it works, and then they actually come to you to say, please, can you help me, <laughs> which is great. Janice, have you ever been in such a situation? Um, to really answer this question, we need to look at, really step into a young person's shoes. Um, 
in situations like that, it can be very intimidating. You are sitting around people who are much older than you, and you feel as though you don't belong. You feel as though um, what you say is not as um, not as academic and beautiful as people that are older than you, and you you say what you have to say, and then to feel as though you are not heard is like how can it be louder? How do I find a voice that is so strong that they have to listen? And I agree with what is said has been said by Yannick and what has been said by my colleague. But I, showing that things have, they can work. But as a young person, we tend to, We have to first combat that why we feel intimidated. Why do we feel as though we're not heard? What was the what was the objective of the session and what was the resolve? Evaluating every step of it so that we know from the for the next jump that this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna say these things, and this is how we're gonna get the result that we definitely need. Thank you so much. And I think this is also having very like three different ways of dealing with this, um, evaluating, making sure you you give uh, an impression of what we can do as young people, or take it up and get as much young people out there to protest. It's three different ways of, of going about this. And I think many young people use these different ways. And it's good that they are, there's also these different ways of, of making sure that young people's voices are heard. Thank you so much. Yeah. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Because I think it's also our responsibility on the other end that are working with governments, that are working with programs to make sure that not only consultations take place, but that young people have a regular seat at decision-making tables. But then we don't want to, as you say, throw them to the wolves by saying, okay, now you have a place, now you go ahead. I think there are many things that we need to do. And what we do in UNFPA, a lot of the time is to work to make sure that there are tools for youth participation, tools for youth leadership, so that young people also can get into what, what to expect and, and how to really you know, practice that with one another. I, I, I think it's, it's too hard to just say that, yes, now you have a seat and go there. It's, it's not working like that. No, I agree. Thank you for that contribution. And I think, indeed, if you look at meaningful youth participation and you look at what are the preconditions for meaningful youth participation, then capacity strengthening of both young people, but also of the older people in the room, to think about how can we work together and also prepare those young people to make sure that, indeed, when they are having a seat on the table, that they can actually voice out. Thank you. It's time for a next... Um, role-playing exercise. Are you excited? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, first, let us uh, get a number. Tip, 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 tip. Number four. Yes. Here in the front. Can you introduce yourself? Do we have another? I have, yeah. I have a mic. Oh, two mics coming to you. Uh, hello, um, my name is Quirin Lenkeik. Uh, I work for Proud, the Dutch sex worker union in the Netherlands, and I'm a young leader. Thank you. Okay, so the, the statement, you want to start a new program in youth SRHR in a small rural community. How do you make sure it meets the needs of the young people that are living there? And you are representing a local NGO today. All right, well, um, I would make sure that I involve the young people that I'm trying to reach in every step of the decision-making process. So um, that goes beyond consulting before implementation, but that they're also part of implementing, monitoring, and evaluating, and if possible, adjusting if needed. Thank you so much. Can we give it up for Quirin? <laughs> There's a chocolate coming your way. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, Quirina said, okay, we, we, I'm going to, I would um, involve young people in every step of designing, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, Bitania, do you have something to add to that? 
So I don't, yeah, it works. Uh, well, it really goes directly into the presentation that I, I presented, the need for empathy. Like I said, young people are very diverse. They have visions, they have dreams, they have a lot of confusions. So if you don't empathize with them to actually understand what their needs are, it's just pointless to just assume what you should provide them. So it's very, very important. And we also need uh, age segregated data because uh, what a 15 year old needs doesn't mean that a 19 year old needs it as well. It's quite different, even uh, as narrow as the adolescence between 15 and 19, uh, they're at different ends of that age. So they have different needs. So really, really empathy and rigor is very, very important to actually design what they need. Making sure that you understand that young people are not one one group, but there's They're not. different realities. Even different all 15-year-olds are different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Fatuma, also, because we're now talking indeed about, about young people, but also how do you make sure that all of these stakeholders, community leaders, and all of the people in the community are, are included? Uh, for me, I agree with uh, both speakers on inclusion of youth, involving them. But the most important thing, the way Britannia has said, is that uh, you need to carry an assessment to, among the youth themselves so that you find out what kind of programs or projects you, you, you need this youth can do. Because I know youth have very good projects and initiatives that they can do themselves if they are given the opportunity to do it. Inclusion in the designing, Inclusion in the program implementation is very important because sometimes we may involve them in the designing but leave them out in the implementation. So implementation leads to the result we are looking at. So how do we uh, include uh, uh, in the program implementation is very important. How do we integrate what the youths are doing and what the community uh, members are also doing? Because if we are to change the narrative, the youths are not in an isolated world. They are within the community. How do we also bring on board the community members to support the youths uh, in what they are doing? So for me, I feel inclusion, engagement, and reaching out to our bigger stakeholders is very important for any program. Thank you so much. So making sure there's an enabling environment and also making sure that indeed it's not just the design, it's not just the implementation, what you see in a lot of, in a lot of programs nowadays, but make sure young people are involved in every step of the way, including the end and the evaluation. All right, we have one more statement. So um, yes, let's generate number 19. Yes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Could you just introduce yourself before okay. we start? Uh, I'm Mohammed Isam from Egypt, a woman delivery angle leader. All right, welcome. So now you're a multilateral funder for five minutes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you hear all the stories that you that were shared today, what would you invest in to ensure youth SRHR? Oh, this is a hard question, actually. Um, I think like my, like the, 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 what, what, what came first in my mind, um, I will give the money to the young leaders themselves, to the, the, the youth themselves, and ask them to design the program for themselves, to define their needs, design it, and work for it. And just being a supporter. Whatever tools they need, whatever supports they need, that's it. They can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. There, chocolate comes your way. Oh, <laughs> Annika, do you have something to add to that? Okay. So I, I fully support that. What I think is then very important so that it doesn't just get to be a smaller program in, in one place is that we really evaluate and we collect data and we do implementation research so that we can scale this up so that the experience of that youth organization working there can be come to the benefit of many others. Because we, we won't get there with SRHR for young people unless we scale up, unless we get governments on board. And, and we need to find all the ways we can and be as innovative as we can, I think, to do that. Um, if I may sa say something that we haven't at all spoken about today, which I was a bit surprised about, and I didn't speak much about it either. 
SRHR for young people, you talk about it as if it's just a health clinical, very clinical thing. I think what is part of young, was as le at least in my mind, very much part of my thinking about when I was 15, was about pleasure, about my own body, and wh how that would work, and how I would have sexual relations, and how do you get into that, and is it awkward, and all of that. And we haven't even touched upon that. And I think we are so used to not speaking about that, as the UN, and as everyone. We have sort of distanced ourselves to SRHR in that way. So if I was, and I am the multilateral <laughs> funder here, <laughs> I think that we need to find ways to include that and, and start, you know, talking about that. And that, I think the multisectoral approach to the SDGs is kind of a platform that for that, where that is possible. But I think we have a lot of work to do with ourselves before we get there, so that young people feel safe talking about this. Talking about it, indeed, and also experience it like that. Would you? Did you want to react? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Does anyone of the panelists wants to react on the pleasure part? Oh, you can take that. Thank you. Yes, I think. It's, it, it takes a while. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that is very interesting issue that uh, I think most of, of of the time we're not talking about pleasure. Um, and and then I think that is something that is very important because I think you, when you talk about sexuality, it's also Im important for young people to understand that uh, sex is not just to 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 have child, but it's also about pleasure. That it's our it's part of our our uh, to have a pleasure. So I think in I think in in in, in our program, of course, that we, I think in some time we are not mentioned directly, but we are giving uh, a choice to young people. If you, you, you want to have sex, have sex, but uh, make sure that you have safe sex. Uh, so we're not talking, even if we are, we are in, our, in, in the community, not just I talk about no, no, no sex, no sex, no sex, and then highlight no sex, but I think because by the time that we, we, we acknowledge that you can have sex, but make a safe sex and then to prevent pregnancy, it's, it's about that we also acknowledge that it's for pleasure. But I think it's something that we, we, we all need. I think it's a challenge we all need to directly to go and talk about it. Let's have sex. Let's have pleasure. Can I add one small thing that I forgot to say? I think why I'm so concerned about this is the only, I think for many young people, the place you go to for understanding this dimension of SRHR is pornography. And it's really damaging, especially we've seen to young brains, young people that see images that are really, really very violent sometimes and very disconnected from where they are. That gives an impression that ruins their, their uh, emotional response later on. And I think we need to find places where we as the UN can deliver apps maybe that can compete with pornography, that are so attractive that they can compete, but they still give the right information. So I'm not saying that you need to go right, Bitani was saying, well, you have been, lived in Ethiopia, you know what it's like, and I know what it's like. It's <laughs> you know not a, an easy thing to talk about, but there can be other ways that we can uh, help support, develop things that can help that discussion. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps if I may add on that, um, well, the one place that I personally feel safe talking about these things is with, the, with my friends and with my age group. So perhaps uh, having youth clubs, I mean, if it's been applied everywhere, or at least in some places that have been successful even. Uh, the From what we heard from Janice is that they have a safe space where girls can talk about these things. So having uh, such platforms for maybe girls and of course maybe girls may not be comfortable talking to guys about these things openly because they're still not sure what they're going through what they want so um, what we have in one of the universities is that uh, in Ethiopia not with PSI but in one of the universities that we have is that um, there's a zero uh, zero plan youth club zero plan is uh, uh, zero chances of getting HIV 
zero, plans, zero chances of unplanned pregnancy, and also zero chances of um, uh, being unsafe. So they have like this uh, pajama parties, small uh, talks, where just girls talk about these kind of things. And then they invite some professionals sometimes to actually talk to them and make them understand all these questions that they have. So having this comfortable uh, sisterhood youth clubs would actually initiate this conversation in, in very uh, difficult societies such as my country, where you cannot talk about pleasure publicly. Thanks so much. Um, you wanted to add something? <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny she may, she says sisterhood because in I'm a Girl Barbados, one of our safe space um, techniques are called sister talk, where we just sit and girls are free to just express however they feel like. And um, this is why we work so hard for girls to get to know their body, get to know how their body looks, how it works, because um, very often when girls um, start to have sex, um, guys tell, try to tell them, oh, this is how it's supposed to feel. Don't worry about it, because they don't know, they don't have the information of how these things are supposed to happen. And because boys... Um, boys and men who also don't have the information are out there giving false information and making girls think that through because they're watching porn and they're, and they're seeing these things and they're like oh this is how it's supposed to be and then putting that pressure on girls to uh, leaving them feeling like oh, I, I don't think I'm doing this right. Um, this can't be right because I'm not necessarily, for him, it's like you're not making me sound that it's supposed to happen or nothing is happening how it's supposed to happen because um, young people are becoming very disconnected when it comes to um, pleasure and emotion. So they're not focusing on how how my body works how um this is supposed to feel but more on how it's supposed to look and how's it supposed to sound because that's the information that they're getting yeah. thank you for that contribution and i think yesterday evening there were also two um um, side events on, on pleasure and uh, the pleasure project has also a framework in which pleasure is kind of broken down into seven teams that makes it for once easier to talk about but also that breaks it down because pleasure is, is, a, is a, a big concept and it's a big thing uh, and it's not only say it is definitely not only safety and it also links to indeed what, what is going on in your emotions and what is going on um, when, when you're having relationships and, and going about that. Um, we have some time to also open up the floor. I see a big burning question here, here, so many. Um, let's take a, a tree for now uh, and let's see if there's more. Um, yeah, the, the lady, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to add to what the, oh, sorry. My name is Mandeep and I am a teacher. I teach grade seven students in Canada in Ontario and uh, I'm part of one of the biggest um, school board. We have excellent um, health and sexual curriculum. We have, we are in a developed country and we have access to everything that I feel like, you know, many countries are not that privileged to have access to those things. Um, I want to mention that the pleasure part is never discussed in our sexual curriculum. The entire curriculum is based on having safe sex, having how to prevent STIs, how to prevent all those infections. Um, and I see every day I catch one boy or maybe some young girls having access to the porn videos. And that's what their, their go-to whenever there's a problem. Online internet is have tons of millions of things for them. And I feel like, you know, we are lacking on that conversations between these young people and being as a teacher and being an advocate for a woman. Um, 
I totally agree with you. You know, sex is discussed in different ways, but pleasure is never discussed. So I think this is very, very important. And I totally agree with you that you ha we have to have some apps. We have to have something that those youth, those young women especially, they have access to that, so they don't get the wrong information. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. And, and just to add to that, I think this also relates to, if we're taking you back to meaning for you participation, because there's a lot of young people asking for it. There's a young of, that you don't go for nothing uh, on the internet to search for this pleasure thing of, of uh, how, do you, how do you go about it and how do you have sex and how do you go about relationships. So make sure that those young people are the core of developing a program and the core of developing such apps, because what do they want? What do they need? Yes, another question. It's me to choose? Yeah, you can choose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Saran from Mongolia. We are Beautiful Hearts Against Sexual Violence NGO, educating and advocating girls how to prevent sexual violence. Uh, I also want to uh, the add for the pleasure, as I want to maybe add some, th maybe intimate justice, like uh, boys have a pleasure, uh, in Mongolian context, but girls never have a pleasure. Like, uh, you know, that's we have to something talk about it. And uh, m maybe like a boys could have a pleasure, but the girls, especially for the girls, we never talk about it, never mentioned. Maybe it's very good to some the new topic, like especially the girls, women can have a pleasure. It should start with when you play a game, you protect yourself with safety gears. And I think we should put it that way that when you want to have pleasure during sex, you need to keep yourself safe by condoms and the other things that are around there. So safety comes after I think pleasure should come first. <laughs> Yay. Can I, uh, yeah, can I just, because we're also here with a very um, knowledgeable people about that know about you powered of, uh, interventions. So as much as I like the whole pleasure discussion, do you have a burning question for my panelists here about their interventions or about the way they're doing uh, their work? Yes. Uh, yes? Uh, thank you very much. I thank the presenters for very good presentations. My name is Lillian Mwanda from Uganda. I'm a judicial officer and uh, well, I could pick it on from pleasure, but basically I'm going to ask for the interventions that they think they can actually assist us with. Um, in Uganda, there is a law, and it is an offense for a person to engage in sexual acts or sexual intercourse with a young girl or a young child of less than 18 years. It's called development. However, when the young, the people that we are talking about now, if they engaged in sexual intercourse or sexual acts, then if they are brought to court as an offense because a young boy has engaged with uh, a young girl, if they are, is brought to court, the young girl is also supposed to be charged because it is both uh, an offense. However, those, because they are young, they could be given a caution as a sentence, and they both go away. Having cautioned them, don't engage in sex because you're still young, your minds are still not able to appreciate sex. And they can go on and study and be well. The unfortunate thing and the challenge for me as a judicial officer is, if the girl went away with that caution, and the boy also went away with the caution, how about if the girl had conceived through the sexual act? She's gotten pregnant. The boy will continue with his studies, but the girl will drop out of school because she is a social misfit. The school can't allow her with her pregnancy into school. She's going to be a bad example to the rest of the students in that school because sex after all, like you're saying, it's not supposed to be discussed, the pleasure of it is not supposed to be discussed. And yet the two of them engaged in that pleasure. So for her, she drops out of school and the boy continues. He can't even finish, get a very good job, but she has dropped out of school after below 18. Her parents feel she's embarrassed them. 
she's a social misfit. Now she has a child. So she's no longer called a girl. She's called a mother. She's no longer a young girl. She's a young lady with a child. So she doesn't fall into categories of a woman because she's under 18. She does not fall into a category of child because she has another child. So basically, and the law does not protect her. That string of uh, the act that, I mean, that category of her is not protected under our laws. We would have to run to other organizations like FIDA in Uganda where we say, okay, you need maintenance. Because the boy will have even dropped her. She needs maintenance for the child. The parents have dropped her. She is basically a, 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 an outcast. Now, how do you, our dear sisters and brother, help intervene in this situation of a person who does not have a identity as we speak now? Thank you. Does anyone want to react to that question? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we may have time for one more. I'm looking at my timekeeper. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Yes. Hi, good. Is it still Martin? <laughs> um, hi, good morning. My name is Alian. I'm actually the founder of I Am A Girl Barbados. So it's a pleasure watching Janice. And great panel, guys. So I have two questions. One to yourself regarding, because I heard in your presentation you spoke very heavily on um, husbands and wives. And I'm curious as to whether in your culture, have you seen, or at least in your project, have you seen um, any couples who haven't necessarily been together or are married necessarily? And also, how do you deal with young girls who do, may not have a partner, so the partner doesn't stick around, or there are issues in that regard? And also, generally to the panel, um, for those who have um, projects in different territories, I'm wondering if at any point have you ever come into the trans community and how, how does that work as far as sexual reproductive health for your particular programs? Because I know within um, Barbados is very taboo, is, is something we are now trying to think about as part of our program. So I'm wondering, do you have any best practices that you can share? One last question yeah, one because, last question. She, oh, oh, sorry, oh, one last question. <laughs> A quick one. <laughs> it's very quick. Uh, thank you, panelists, for all this. But um, I just had one question. We are talking about pleasure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am Stella Maris Amabilis. I'm a judicial officer like my colleague from Uganda and also a woman activist. I work with the National Association of Women Judges. We fight for many of these things that are going on. And uh, one of the things we realized is many times the men are not brought on board. So in our project, we try to bring men on board so that they try to write gender sensitive judgments. Now, my question is on the issue of pleasure. Uh, one of our presenters, I don't know if it was Britannia or Denise, said something like, uh, oh, it was Britannia. She said something like, you have to go to the other youth to you know, find out how they can handle this and all that you discuss it amongst yourselves. But uh, what I was trying to think about was, is it possible for us to start from home whereby we as mothers, we try to talk to our children. We try to make them understand this from our own perspective so that when they go out, they don't get so much in their heads. Because I believe that as girl children, when you're growing, because I personally, I had that opportunity with my mother. My mother tried to teach me what she could, even if culture did not allow it, but she tried to make me learn certain things. Because I believe that when we go out, we get too much from outside than when, you know, when you're seated with somebody who is close to you, you get a bit of what you should get. Thank you. Okay, we have five more minutes. So I don't want to rush you, but I do want to rush you. <laughs> um, so it, if I'll quickly go over the answers. Yeah. Um, I will sp I'll skip the first one and just go on through. Uh, the second question, because I'll give uh, the chance for the other panelists to 
reflect on the first one. So um, the first question, the sec your question that I got is, do we target unmarried couple? Well, amongst the many adolescent projects that we have, I just spoke about the Smart Start project that are focused on and targeting the married uh, young girls in the rural areas. Um, it's very illegal and it's uh, on, the, on the law of Ethiopia to get married before the age of 18, but in the remote uh, areas of Ethiopia, it's very common to send off, to marry off your children. And even the girls themselves are okay because it's very um, accepted and endorsed by the community that getting married is very common and it's a status in the community. So once they're married, they're expected to prove fertility. So, and we can't stop the, the teenage uh, marriage, but what we can stop is delay or the unwanted pregnancy, even if within its uh, marriage. And if you just go there and tell them not to have kids after they get married, it doesn't work. That's why we had to resonate with them and empathize with them to, to try to tell them the financial benefits of delaying pregnancy because obviously it's very, very much endorsed to have kids and to get married young in the community. So now when you're uh, changing the narrative talking about the financial needs and dreams that they have for themselves, then they start listening. Because if you just start talking about family planning, nobody wants to hear it. Having family, big families, is like wealth in the community. And uh, the very certain dream that a girl can achieve is motherhood. So that's the easiest path for girls to follow. But when you start talking about the visions that they have for themselves, the financial sustainability that they can achieve without, without having kids right away, then they start listening. That's why the community is now working with us to actually ensure uh, financial stability through family planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, transgenders, no, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a taboo. We don't talk about homosexuality or transgender in Ethiopia because it's, uh, a federal offense to actually talk about these things because it's very religious and very, um, how do I say, <laughs> conservative co society. So I have no experience working with that group. Thank you. Okay, because of, because of time, I'm uh, gonna give Janice the floor and then I'd like to invite all of you who have more questions to stay in the room and talk to our panelists uh, privately, sorry, outside the room because we have to get outside the room. So sorry for being a bit rude. But uh, Janice, go for um, it. To your question about, um, so for I'm a Girl Barbados, what we have started to do is have sessions where we invite parents to come in and discuss with them, um, give them to say the talk, give them the talk so that they will know how to talk to their children about these different things and because we cater to girls ages 5 to 18 our aim is to start that conversation from a younger age um, appropriate to their age and their understanding so that they by the time they're age 15 they're very equipped and they know what they they want they know what to say and they know how to handle situations thank you so much no, I'm sorry. I really have to be uh, 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 stuck on time because uh, I have my man in the back who's saying, get out of the room. Uh, so I'm sorry. Um, but I really invite you to, uh, to get out of the room, but, uh, but you can still uh, uh, talk to uh, our panelists uh, who are going to stay hopefully a bit longer. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for being here with us as well to discuss uh, your participation and we're going to do a group picture. Thank you.